Okay, so uh, thank you for, for having me. Uh, this is my work with Dan Friedman, who's with us. Um, so I'm going to just uh, just launch into it, and then maybe towards the end we can talk about how this is related to the theme of this series. Um, you know, the, the, the general point is that this is, this sort of represents an idea of how we can take the types of individual level um, experiments that have become sort of dominantly popular in experimental behavioral economics and connect it to traditional aggregate interests of economists. And so, you know, this is a this is a first move in that direction. I think that this could be a very uh, fertile way of doing research. This sort of trying to draw out the connections between individual level um, uh, measurement of cognitive capacity, reasoning, and preferences, and aggregate outcomes in in markets and other social institutions. Markets probably networks as well. Uh, so to um, to start off, uh, one way of thinking about what we're doing is we're connecting two experimental literatures. And one of them is uh, on general equilibrium. Uh, so this is the literature on experimental markets. And the way these, uh, these, uh, this experimental literature usually works, going back to Chamberlain and Vernon Smith, is that you construct economies in a laboratory using artificial induced preferences, right? So the, this is an example from an experiment that uh, Sean Crockett, Charlie Plot, and I did um, about a decade ago. Uh, I want to give subjects in a laboratory experiment Leontief preferences of a particular character. And so, so uh, they're going to be trading units X for units Y in a market. Um, and I'm going to pay them money based on their terminal uh, allocation of X and Y. And so I show them a bunch of Leontief indifference curves. They type in the number of units of X. Can everybody see my mouse? Yes. My point is, they type in the number of units of X and the number of units of Y. It shows up as a dot. They see where their indifference curve is. They can go off the indifference curve. It'll show the same thing. It tells them the number of points and they get paid for points. And so the idea here is to sort of surgically transplant an artificial set of preferences into subjects. Uh, and then we can build co uh, economies by interacting subjects with, uh, with uh, endowments and preferences of different forms. This is, again, I'm not going to go into detail on this paper, but I just want to give you the back background. This is the paper I'm mentioning with Sean and Charlie. And this is a this is a strange economy uh, called uh, Gale's economy. Um, the details of this Edgeworth box don't matter uh, <clears throat> all that much, but based on the preferences that I induced on subjects, I can get expansion paths for two types of subjects. I can look at what the aggregate, the average aggregate um, uh, endowment is. I can calculate what a competitive equilibrium price tunnel looks like. You know, this is just a standard edge with box. I can look at what net supply and demand looks like, given the preferences I gave subjects at all prices. And uh, here's another way of seeing the same competitive equilibrium. There's a competitive equilibrium tunnel, and we have a prediction of, uh, of what should happen. We ran this experiment uh, because this is a, uh, a weird economy that acts as a kind of stress test on properties of disequilibrium prices in, in general equilibrium. Uh, and this is the type of question you can ask if you're inducing preferences on subjects. Because I'm inducing preferences for these subjects, I can control features of the economy, not only the competitive equilibrium, but what excess demand looks like outside of competitive equilibrium. So this is a weird uh, economy where excess demand is positive when prices are above the competitive equilibrium and they're negative when they're below. So this is this has a very weird uh, prediction that unless prices happen to start out right in the competitive equilibrium tunnel, if you believe that uh, disequilibrium prices are governed by Tatanamont dynamics, prices should shoot up forever if they happen to start above competitive equilibrium and they should collapse to zero if they happen to start below. 
And this is the type of question you can ask with induced preferences. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm emphasizing this because it's important to understand that uh, unlike many contemporary experiments, the goal is not to understand anything about preferences. You impose preferences in order to, under, to ask other types of questions, in this case, questions about dynamics. And when we ran this experiment, this is the uh, zoomed out, this is these blue lines are the competitive equilibrium tunnel and it happened that prices started above the competitive equilibrium and they shot up uh, on order, order of magnitude above the competitive equilibrium. You had a strong tetanomont dynamics moving away competitive, from competitive equilibrium. Later on, we imposed uh, uh, price controls that forced excess demand to start below zero and prices converged in the opposite direction to zero. Okay, and so this ended up being strong evidence of period to period tetanomont dynamics. Um, moving prices around in the double auction institution we ran this experiment. Again, that's the type of question that this literature has usually been focused on. The other literature, the absolute opposite extreme of experimental and behavioral economics is a literature that, uh, that's uh, trying to measure uh, subjects' preferences by uh, giving subjects endowments and prices and trying to measure the, the revealed preferences based on choices. And so you give subjects a bunch of budget lines and they choose bundles of assets. Here's an example. This is using our software that we're going to use here, but um, uh, the, the goal here is to learn about real individual preferences. So here's an example with Aero Securities. Um, there's a, a unit of a good that I call heads um, and a unit of a good that I call tails. They give subjects a budget line. Uh, they can click anywhere uh, um, on this budget line to choose an allocation. And, uh, and then we're gonna flip a coin to decide whether the heads or the tails are valuable at the end. And when you run experiments like this, this is from my data, but this looks very much like the stuff in uh, Choi et al. You get a, a huge heterogeneity across subjects and what people's preferences, in this case for risk look like. Okay, so here's a subject who looks uh, like uh, he or she has um, log preferences. This is a subject who looks infinitely risk averse. This is a subject who looks maybe disappointment averse. By the way, this, sorry, I, I didn't explain um, what this is showing. This is showing log price against units of X heads in this graph over units of X plus Y, heads plus tails. So these are log preferences. These are uh, infinitely risk averse preferences. Uh, these are disappointment averse preferences. This is uh, a strange non monotone demand pattern that shows up in, as far as we can tell, all, the, all data on this topic. This shows up in Troy et al. and shows up here as well. So you get this massive heterogeneity across subjects and what, what their preferences for risk look like. Okay, so what, 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 what I'm going to do in this paper, what we do in this paper is um, we developed some new methods to study experimental general equilibrium using economies that aren't constructed using uh, a mathematical example. They're constructed using subjects' actual preference. And the questions we're going to ask uh, are these. One is we want to just know some things about the preferences themselves. If I take a bunch of preferences measured in, say, a setting like Choi et al., and I, uh, and I want to find out what types of economies they generate. Um, I can just measure individual decision making, and then I can form lots and lots of sort of counterfactual economies from people's preferences. In order to do that, I need to run uh, the experiment slightly different from previous experiments on this. And then I can ask questions about what types of economies as mathematical objects emerge from uh, the preferences, uh, the sort of distributions of preferences that subjects actually reveal in a revealed preferences type exercise. And then part two, I can allow people to actually trade in a subset of these economies that you can construct out of people's preferences uh, by sorting subjects uh, judiciously into markets. And I can ask a second question. 
if I were to just look at subjects revealed preferences and make predictions about what should happen in markets, are those preference measurements stable enough for those predictions to actually meaningfully organize behavior in the markets? Okay, and so you can see these two questions talk to one another. Um, if we ever wanted to, uh, to deploy a research methodology in which we, we actually just measure individual decision making, uh, look at what the aggregate implications of that individual decision making looks like, uh, and then make predictions based on it, uh, how well would those predictions perform? And if we want to ask questions like that, we need to ask question two. Okay, so that's the, that's the big picture. In order to do this, here's the research strategy. The experiment's divided into two phases. In phase one, we do something very similar to Choi et al. with a couple of tweaks that I'll describe. Subjects reveal their preferences for risk by choosing allocations of error securities on 25 budget lines. And then we construct economies from these preferences by sorting subjects uh, based on characteristics of the preferences they reveal to us. And it gives us completely non-parametric general equilibrium predictions. So we're not going to uh, structurally estimate anything. We're just going to look arithmetically at what sort of economies emerge from subjects sorted in various ways. We're going to be able to ask a classic type of question uh, of great concern traditionally to general equilibrium theorists, which is, what do these aggregate excess demands look like? And are they pathological in the sense of generating multiple equilibria or failing to produce equilibria as cautioned by the sun and shine map of the group theorem, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Then in phase two of the experiment, I'm actually going to have subjects trade in, these, in some of these economies that we construct. We'll do it in, using a very simple market institution, the, uh, the variation on the Tatanma market institutions. And I'll look at where prices end up. And I'll ask whether the preferences I measured in phase one are stable enough um, to allow markets to converge to the prediction I would have made if I'd only seen the phase one uh, decisions. And that's the basic idea of the, of the experiment. <clears throat> okay, uh, let's get into details. Now I'm just gonna show you a lot of pictures for the rest of the talk. So if you don't like text, you're in luck. Uh, every session has 28 subjects and uh, half of them are randomly assigned as X types who have 100 units of good X. This is an X type and zero units of good Y. This dot shows an initial endowment. Y types start out with 76 units of Y and zero units of X. And this is totally exogenous and subjects remain in their type for the entire experiment. Okay, <clears throat> and then I have 25 prices. Uh, both types are going to experience the same prices. Um, these, uh, these are budget lines produced uh, jointly by the price, uh, by each of these prices and the subject's endowment. These tiny unreadable numbers show what the prices are. I'm going to show them a screen like this. The big difference between this and um, and previous experiments like Choi et al. is is we're we're going to keep the endowment fixed. Because we're going to keep the endowment fixed, we can't test any any classic questions about revealed preference axioms. We can't test for uh, consistency or uh, or war. But that's not the purpose here. In any case, the preferences look very similar to what shows up in prior literature. So we give subjects an endowment, and they're basically going to see different prices in an erratic order um, as budget lines coming out of this fixed endowment. And the idea, the thing that makes this an endowment, other than the fact that it anchors all of the prices, is that the subjects choose not to click anywhere. They can just keep their initial endowment by pressing confirm. And again, these are error securities, which means the number of units of X uh, uh, with probability 0.5 is going to determine their payoff number of units of Y with probability 0.5 is going to determine the payoffs. Okay, so here's an example from an actual subject of, uh, of choices. 
of initial choices of these 25 budget lines, I'm going to call this phase 1P. We'll call this the practice choices because I'm going to confront subjects with the exact same prices again and have them make all the same choices. But again, it's in an erratic order, so it's not really, this, it's actually quite difficult to make consistent choices here. As it happens, subjects make remarkably consistent choices, which as far as I know, has never been documented before. And I think it says some very nice things about this, uh, the, the Choi et al. research agenda. Uh, okay, so these solid dots are in what I'll call phase 1R, the real choices. The hollow dots are phase 1P, those are practice choices. And the comparison between those two is going to end up serving as a kind of noise measure that we can use later on uh, when making predictions. <clears throat> okay, so let's just get rid of these uh, 1P choices and just look at the 1R choices. This is the main thing we're going to use for our analysis. And most importantly, it's going to be the main thing we use to sort subjects in the markets. <clears throat> okay, so in order to do the sorting, we had to do something that's, that's relatively easy to deploy with minimal programming uh, in the lab on the fly, because I actually have these subjects sitting making these choices, and then halfway through the experiment, I need to put them into markets. And so <clears throat> our idea here was that we can take this price of 0.76, this is the unique price uh, that both X type subjects and Y type subjects face. All the other price, uh, uh, excuse me, it's the unique budget line that both types of subjects actually face. So all of their options are exactly the same. They're facing the same prices, but that's going to produce different budget sets uh, because it's coming from different endowments. And the idea is uh, uh, if subjects choose less X, their preferences uh, um, under some um, reasonable assumptions are probably more convex. And so we're going to divide subjects up into more convex types and less convex types uh, using the decisions of this price. Okay, so uh, in blue, and this is a, a um, graphical convention I'll use for the rest of the uh, presentation. Blue is going to represent low, uh, relatively low convexity people, and red is going to be relatively high convexity people. <clears throat> and so by comparing uh, to the median subjects choice on this budget set, I can group subjects into what I'll call HX or HY types, high convexity X endowed types, or high convexity Y endowed types, or LX or LY, low convexity X types, low convexity Y types. Okay, and that's going to give me, that's going to partition the subjects. Um, I've already partitioned them based on exogenous assignment of X type and Y type. Now I'm gonna partition them based on their choices in phase 1P into also high convexity or low convexity types. So that's gonna give me a total of four types of subjects. And those are going to be the basic building blocks and ingredients I'll use to, that we'll use to um, construct economies. Okay, so that's, all right. So <clears throat> now I have an example. Uh, it, it, it happens that this subject, because this is, I'm showing here, uh, choices by all the other subjects in their, uh, in their cohort. This is the subject being pictured choices. You can see that it uh, it's uh, that their X decisions are higher than the median, and so now I've colored them blue. Subject is an example of an uh, of an LX type. This is a subject uh, a, a subject's choice is relative to subjects in her cohort. You can see that uh, she has less than the median number of units of X, and so she's been uh, classified as a high convexity type. Okay, so now I can construct, I'll construct in every session four economies by partitioning subjects twice on type. So I'm going to put to put a bunch of subjects together who are low convexity. I'm going to put, and I'll call these LX, LY economies. These are economies in which I have low convexity X types, low convexity Y types matched together to trade with one another. And the, the complement HX, HY subjects will also be in their own markets. And these are the main, we'll call these the main economies. This is where more, most of our ex-ante hypotheses come from. This is our main interest. 
And then um, just to fill things out, we did the complimentary partition afterwards, in what we'll call the shuffle economy. So I took all the low convexity X types and matched them up with all the high convexity Y types. <clears throat> so the key thing here is because uh, I observed subjects' preferences, I can use phase one choices and a little bit of baby GE theory to form some predictions. And I'm going to get two types of predictions. Uh, I'll have some ex ante predictions. That is, before ever seeing um, the actual preferences of subjects, I have some comparative statics for what the differences should look like between a low convexity economy and a high convexity economy. But then I also can do ex post predictions conditional on what subjects chose in phase one, economy by economy, I'll have specific point predictions about where prices and allocations should go in a market based on the economies uh, that come right out of their measured preferences. And the neat thing here is that we've designed this so I don't have to make any structural assumptions about preferences. So the exercise is not going to be I'll measure, I'll, I'll structurally estimate some CRA parameters and then make some predictions based on that. I can do it directly using exactly what they show me and I'll show you how I can do that. So um, I'm going to show you examples using pair replica economies using actual subjects from our data. Here's subject 27 from session three and subject 22 from session one. These subjects have very nice looking preferences. Uh, they, they're, they're basically log preferences. <clears throat> if I want to understand what a replica economy made up of a bunch of these types of subjects and a bunch of these types of subjects look like, I can just use algebra. I can sum their, their number of units of X minus their endowment of X across subjects at each price. And it's going to give me this X is demand function. Okay, so these subjects together form this economy, this um, high convexity risk averse uh, economy. So this is an aggregate excess demand. Where the aggregate excess demand uh, crosses zero, I have a competitive equilibrium prediction. I'll call it the revealed competitive equilibrium prediction. It's the competitive equilibrium prediction formed of what subjects revealed to us in phase one of the experiment. And so the prediction would be if I had a bunch of subjects who look just like this and a bunch of subjects who look just like this, enough so that competitive equilibrium is a reasonable um, uh, way of predicting behavior, then I would expect prices to converge, uh, in this case, to um, something like, like this. I can also uh, produce Edgeworth boxes using this. And I confess that uh, getting to produce empirical Edgeworth boxes based on preferences was one of my major motivations for this. Uh, I thought that sounded fun, and it was. Um, so I, what I can do is I, I, I can plot offer curves based on subjects' average choices. Uh, in, in the example I just gave, there's only one subject on each side of the market, so the average is just the subject's choices. But more, in, more generally, when I have a bunch of subjects together in the lab, I can look at the average. And this will give me two offer curves. It'll give me another way of visualizing the competitive equilibrium prediction. And it'll also give me an allocation prediction of where the, uh, of, uh, of where this economy should end up. Now I can do comparative statics here because this is an example of a relatively high convexity set of subjects. These are we're both in their sessions type as the HX and HY subjects. Here's an extreme low convexity, a pair of low convexity subjects. So these are people who are making perfectly risk neutral choices. And remember we have a uh, there's a prediction here that less convex agents should produce higher revealed competitive equilibrium prices. So I can do the exact same exercise I did before, take uh, X minus endowment of X, add them up at every price, and I get this, this really steep excess demand function that again gives me a competitive equilibrium prediction. In this case, uh, uh, because of discreteness, I'm going to have a, a, a small tunnel. So there's going to be a small range of prices that are consistent with reveal compatibility. 
And so I get comparative statics here. Uh, the, the high convexity risk reverse uh, economy produces a lower price than the uh, low convexity economy. And this is, a, this is sort of one of our main ex ante predictions. Okay, so now in phase two, I'm going to uh, I'm going to actually run markets based on those H X H Y L X L Y H X L Y L X H Y economies that I described earlier. And I'm going to do it using the simplest um, uh, market institution we can think of, uh, a Tatanamont market. The reason we didn't use a more natural seeming market like a double auction. Um, was because uh, uh, we, we want to keep endowments fixed. Uh, all of our predictions are going to be a, spe uh, a specific initial endowment. And if we allow interim trade, that's going to be moving around. Uh, so at least for this very first um, exercise, we wanted to do some, we wanted to use an institution in which the endowment is, is fixed over the uh, process of price changing. So what subjects do here is they submit demands at every price. Prices start at 1.57. We have a rule that adjusts in radians according to the sign of excess demand. Uh, we have a dampening rule that slows the market down as things move forward. And then markets end up closing if the absolute value of average excess demand uh, is less than two for three consecutive rounds. And again, this is this was all done for convenience and to make things simple for a first exercise. Um, but, you know, one of the exciting things is to think about how you could uh, do this in a more realistic institution in which endowments are changing over the course of trade. So subjects had a total in phase one of 50 choice periods. Then they had two market periods, one in which they're in the LXLY or HXHY economy and then in one of the shuffle economies. And they only have one decision paid over the um, over the experiment. We ran four sessions, 28 subjects each of group college. Um, that gives us a total of 16 economies or markets. Uh, we we uh, put together a, a rule in the software that filtered out two subjects who seemed erratic. So we had a little rule that involved uh, uh, dem really extreme demand ch uh, changes. We had this idea that we were going to have some subjects inevitably who weren't paying very much attention and we wanted to filter them out. This was um, subjects who were filtered out, were not kicked out of the lab. They still made decisions in the market. They, the the Tatanamon institution just ignored them. Um, in fact, I don't believe we even told subjects that they might be filtered out. Maybe we did. Uh, in any case, this was a huge failure. These two erratic subjects uh, are not the most erratic subjects uh, in their sessions. They look totally normal. Uh, their preferences look very reasonable. And um, it, this ended up penalizing subjects who had slips of the hand and had one strange decision. And so um, the subjects we kicked out of the market are pretty much a, a, ran a random four subjects for each session. Okay, so. What kind of questions do we can we answer with this type of experiment? One comes from a sort of uh, existential crisis in general equilibrium theory, the sunshine mantle de Brew theorem, which roughly speaking says that even if everybody's preferences uh, look pretty nice, um, if they, even if, even with very neoclassical subject uh, subjects or agents, uh, you can get. Uh, aggregation pathologies and the, the types of pathologies we're thinking about are things like non-existence of equilibrium, multiplicity, um, uh, tetanomon instability, and uh, so the idea here is that um, that even though very strange and exotic non-monotonic preferences can produce weird economies, you can also get extremely weird economies if you get the wrong intersection of endowments and preferences. And it's very hard to rule these, these sorts of um, problematic economies, these unpredictable economies out ex ante. Uh, th these things happen due to non-substitutability. 
and um, uh, wealth effects. They lead to you know, basically backwards spending supply. And we can ask a question, well, if we take people's actual preferences and we aggregate them, do they suffer from these types of pathologies? Um, there's reasons to think maybe just based on the Choi et al. data, this is one of our motivating ideas. Uh, what you see in Choi et al. data is all kinds of extreme hedging heuristics, sometimes really severe non-monotonicities in demand. And so you, you could imagine that, um, that in a market for risk, um, you, you should expect lots of pathologies to emerge. Um, so our prediction here, our ex-ante prediction, is that we should see these more often in these high convexity economies in which the conditions for sunshine and the brew are stronger than in low convexity economies. And so we wanna, we wanna use subjects' own preferences as a treatment instrument to make these pathologies more and less um, uh, extreme. Uh, just by sorting subjects based on what we observe in phase one. So here's an illustration. Uh, this is something I showed you before. These are very normal subjects with log preferences um, with a unique competitive equilibrium. Everything looks very neoclassical. Uh, here's two subjects that, um, uh, that show up in data like this. If I aggregated these subjects, I would get no interior competitive equilibrium at all. And you know these subjects show up. They're in the uh, they're in the data. Here's another uh, pair of subjects. If I were to create replica economies with lots of subjects of each of these types and aggregate them, okay. So this the so this is something I really want to emphasize. This is not a simulation question. This is a question about the. This is as much a question about the nature of subjects' preferences as the the preferences on their own. This is. We can ask questions about the distribution of economies that emerge from more and less heterogeneous uh, economies constructed out of subject preferences. You can think of an economy as, uh, as an aggregate measure, uh, like a mean uh, that, that's implicit in a set of subjects' preferences. And so we can always take subject preferences if they're, if they're measured in the right way and answer questions about the sort of distribution of of economies and types of equilibria and properties of equilibria that are implicit in subjects' own preferences. Okay, question two uh, is, well, when I actually take a subset of these economies that are implicit in subjects' own preferences, um, are they actually stable enough to, be, to meaningfully predict what happens when we radically move context into a market? Um, do they generate predictable market behavior? Uh, another way of, of posing that question is, you know, this is, I think, more or less equivalent question is, does volatility, the volatility we observe in stage one preferences, and remember, I, I observe subjects' decisions twice, and so I get a measure of how volatile their preferences. Does the volatility in stage one preferences predict the equilibration in stage two, or is there a more fundamental destabilization when we move from elicitation to market interaction. So we have a method for doing this that seems that has the advantage of being transparent and simple. Uh, there are other ways of doing this. We've done it a few different ways and we get very similar results. It uses the discrepancies in 1P and 1R choices to measure individual variability. And we can use that to pre-classify every revealed competitive equilibrium for any set of subjects we're matched together as either robust or fragile based on whether we, we would expect that measured variability in subjects' preferences and for subjects' demands to regularly interfere with the Tatanamot dynamic. Would we expect the Tatanamot process to be interrupted by flickering movements in subjects' preferences? And so just to give you a quick illustration of this, Here's a subject's 1R choices. Here's a subject's 1P choices. These red lines are the differences. This is a measure of volatility. I can take all of these and I can throw them into a CDF. And there I have an individual's uh, measure of preference volatility. Okay. And what I can do is I can, I, so I'm going, this is, you can think of this as, as an additional thing. In addition to subject's preferences, I have this for every subject and I can use these. Here's a, here are excess demands from two actual economies that we actually ran markets on. This is a, an example of a 
low convexity economy. Here's an example of a high convexity economy. <clears throat> Here are the revealed competitive equilibria for these economies. And our idea is we draw from individual error distributions and we append subjects demand. So we're looking at all the possible sort of realizations we would expect based on the sort of variability of individual subjects. And we aggregate, so you can probably maybe see very light line around this. So I've aggregated subjects appended with their errors. I'm not sure if you guys can see these, but I'm gonna do this thousands of times. Maybe you can see this do this thousands of times and we're going to start getting this uh, to see a sort of band around the excess demand of the possible realizations we should expect just based on what we saw early on in uh, before we ever saw subjects in the markets. We'll take the inner quartile of the, these ranges and so we get volatility bands. We call it economy uh, robust but these volatility bands never cross zero uh, outside of the competitive equilibrium. So these are cases where we should expect smooth sailing for, for instance, uh, excess demand driven Tatanamont dynamics. So this is an example of a robust economy. Here's an example of a fragile economy. Out, uh, away from the competitive equilibrium tunnel, this volatility band crosses zero. And so we should expect, you know, it, it's plausible that we would, uh, with reasonable uh, regularity, see excess demand going in the wrong direction to push to Tanama where we, we're uh, towards competitive equilibrium. Okay, so we expect to see more fragile economies and high convexity economies and low eco uh, convexity economies for exactly the same reason that high convexity economies tend to produce um, uh, violations of sunshine mantle of the brew that basically create flat excess demand that's more likely come close to and sometimes cross over uh, the zero line. Okay, so let's just get into results because um, we get results that look a lot like Choi et al. Here's a, a risk averse log preferences subject. Here's a risk neutral subject. Here's a crazy subject. There's a couple of people like this who make a lot of dominated choices. Uh, infinitely risk averse and then these, these strange non-monotonic patterns that, um, that everyone in this literature has seen before. Okay, so to ask question one, getting these types of preferences is not new. What's new is asking questions about what types of economies come out of these types of preferences. And your first instinct might be, well, these, um, uh, I just need to look at individual preferences and ask questions about something about these individual preferences or individual is this individual a, a pathological economy creating individual and one way of uh, um, of thinking about the problem of aggregation is described in the sunshine mantle the de Bruyne theorem is that that you can't answer that question um, the the what matters is the combination of subjects so it's the distribution of agents that determine that decides whether you're going to get pathological economies Okay, which means I need to, I kind of want to do something that's like looking at individual preference graphs, but I want to be able to ask questions about economies. And the closest I can get to the, that twin set of goals is to just look at the simplest, least heterogeneous economies we could produce. The thing that's closest to looking at individual decision making. So I can take from my data set uh, pairs of, uh, of subjects combine them into competitive, into excess demand, into economies, look at the properties of the economies, and then sample again. And I can do this over and over again. And I get a sense of what the distribution of economies implicit in the collected set of preferences looks like. Okay? And uh, the basic answer is that uh, they're a mess, as you would expect. We get existence and uniqueness only 60% of the time. I, I don't know if that sounds good to you, but that's pretty bad. Um, so uh, almost half the time we do get path pathologies. And if we were also looking at this measure of robustness I described earlier, economies where not only do we have a unique equilibrium, but uh, that unique equilibrium is something we would actually expect economies to converge to based on robustness, based on the stability of preferences, it should only about, be about 20% of the time. Okay, so re replica economies are a mess. But the actual aggregate excess demands 
the actual economies we decided to take into the lab to run markets on are not a mess. And the key distinction, uh, which I'll just discuss in a little bit more detail in a few slides, is that these are economies formed of 12 different subjects, whereas these economies are produced with two types of subjects. So what I'm doing here is I'm replicating each of a pair of subjects a bunch of times and looking at what kind of economies produced. Whereas here, when I actually formed economies uh, to study in the lab, I took 12 subjects at each time. And that's going to be important. Okay, I get competitive equilibrium prediction. So just based on subjects' uh, preferences, we get this comparative static prediction, which is something we need if we want to test this prediction in the lab. That low in every one of these, this is session one, this is session two, this is session three, session four. In every one of these, the low convexity economy has a higher predicted price than the high convexity economy. Okay. All right, so this is a point I need to make to establish these volatility bounds I told you about. This is what a subject, if, if I observed subjects uh, making random choices on their budget lines and, and looked at the distribution of errors and differences that would look like this gray line. <clears throat> uh, this is for the actual economies we form. So subjects are making very non-random choices. Uh, in the, um, uh, and so uh, they're not perfectly stable, but they're, uh, they're much stabler than random. And as I said before, following the exercise I just described, I can put volatility bands. I don't know if you can see these very well, but these are these shaded bands around here. And I can use those. Let's just zoom in on the main economies for a minute to look at what the volatility bands look like. I'm going to put an R on the right and left of the equilibrium to describe robust economies and an F for fragile economies. Remember, we're always going to be initiating price above. Uh, uh, at a price that's way above the competitive equilibrium. And so these economies are all robust everywhere. This first economy is robust everywhere. These other high convexity economies are fragile. They, the, the volatility bands cross. So we would expect in these economies to see convergence to competitive equilibrium. We would not expect to see them uh, here, or at least we wouldn't be surprised if we didn't see convergence because these are fragile. Subjects' preferences are volatile relative to um, to the uh, flatness of excess demand. And notice that, vol that high convexity subjects aren't particularly more uh, volatile than low convexity subjects. This is driven by the shape of excess demand, not by high convexity subjects being particularly volatile subjects. Okay, that's all good. okay so let's look at what actually happens in our markets. I'm going to flip access demand. I'm sorry the, the fonts are small, but hopefully you can see them more easily on your screen. On the left side of each of these panels, I'm going to show access demand, and I'm going to show access demand. I'm going to flip the graphs I just showed you. I'm going to show access demand on the x-axis, and I'm going to show you price on the y-axis. And I'm going to do it session by session, looking at the main economy. So this is on the left is the low convexity economy. Right, it's a high convexity economy for session one. So let's just, this is excess demand. This is where excess demand crosses zero. This is the competitive equilibrium tunnel. As I said before, in the low convexity economy, we predict a higher price than in the high convexity economy. And then on the right, I'm going to show over market rounds what happens to price in the actual markets. <clears throat> and uh, they quickly converge to the competitive equilibrium here. And they converge to the competitive equilibrium here. This is the one high convexity market uh, that is robust. Uh, if you remember, I said that three of them are not robust. This one is robust. And we get convergence to competitive equilibrium. In both these cases. So we get, uh, th this turns out to be true universally. We always have prices obeying comparative statics within session. So, High convexity economy uh, markets always produce prices as predicted that are high that are higher than low convexity economies. Okay, so uh, 
prices also uh, universally converge when the review uh, revealed competitive equilibrium is robust. Uh, but they rarely do when they're fragile. So you can see here that the prices drop towards competitive equilibrium. They even reach the edge of the competitive equilibrium tunnel and they sort of bounce out because we just have excess mm -hmm. demand fluctuating back and forth. Here's session two, uh, session three. So this was session two. Session three, same pattern, exact same sort of stuff. Session four, same pattern. Here's all the shuffle economies, and we basically get the same kind of pattern everywhere. Okay, let's look at allocations. Same data. This is now I get to draw my empirical edge with boxes, my main motivation for writing this paper. Here's the low convexity uh, session one, high convexity session one. You can draw the, the aggregate offer curves. Uh, you can look at where they cross. I'm going to show you a circle with an X through them through it uh, that will show you where the final allocation was. I will first I'll show you the competitive equilibrium tunnel. So this is competitive equilibrium right through the offer curves. This is the high convexity economy in session one. And there we have it's basically nailing the allocation. Same thing here, remember this is the one high convexity economy that actually converged into the competitive equilibrium tunnel. Again, we get convergence to the competitive equilibrium allocation. This one's a little bit off, but it's not that off. Uh, so the allocations are actually turn out to be pretty good, even though the um, uh, volatility keeps, it, keeps the prices from perfectly converging. And just, you know, again, we, when, uh, when a market is, uh, robust or when an economy is robust, the market converges, doesn't quite converge otherwise. There's more examples. So anyway, there's lots of pictures like this in the, in the paper. Okay, so let's get to Sanju's point. Let's talk about aggregation. Okay, so what I did before is I took the, uh, the group of subject, uh, I, I took my sample of subjects, I sampled one subject of each type, I smashed them together, I formed an economy, I drew excess demand, and you get this really, really messy um, looking set of excess demands where we get multiple crossings and failures of existence and non robust. Okay, now this is a replica, this is a pair replica economy. So, what I don't want you to be thinking of this as is a description of what happens when two subjects are interacting with one another. This is what happens when two subjects, when there's only two types of preferences in the economy. That is when the economy is extremely uh, homogeneous. And the, the way to read this result is given subjects preferences, homogeneous economies are going, um, constructed of those preferences are going to tend to have multiple crossings or they're going to have non-existence. That's going to happen at a very high rate. When I look at the side, at, at, the size of economies, again, this is using the exact same sub, uh, sample of subjects. When I form economies with 12 subjects of each, you can see this distribution tightens, okay? And we get uh, uh, economies that are unique and robust, or equilibria that are unique and robust 50% of the time instead of 50% of the time. And when I aggregate the full sample, so I'm letting all of the heterogeneity in the data contribute to excess demand, I get a nice, neat competitive, uh, neat competitive equilibrium. Okay, and so these uh, these sunshine mantle de Bru pathologies are very much um, uh, consistent with subjects' preferences, but they're not consistent with the heterogeneity that that uh, that Choi et al. first observed. The fact that subjects have wildly heterogeneous preferences, as it turns out, is the reason uh, that as we make the economies more heterogeneous, uh, as we let that heterogeneity seep into excess demand, excess demand starts looking better behaved. And this is an empirical question whether this would have happened this way. Let me show you, you know, there's a, there's a long old literature um, 
in general equilibrium theory that sort of came out in the wake of the sunshine man the Bru theorem on heter heterogeneity. Uh, here's an example. This is an actual set of preferences from my um, from my data set. Excuse me. This is an actual excess demand uh, from my data set. Here's another excess demand from the data set. Again, this is taking two pairs of subjects. So this is one pair of subject. It's crossing zero multiple times. It has multiplicity. In blue, I have another set of preferences. It's also crossing zero multiple times, creating multiplicity. But if I were to take these two multiple equilibria producing economies and put them together, that is, if I was taking, if I was to take the heterogeneity from each of them and add and include them together in the market. So that basically involves adding those up, we get a unique equilibrium. And that's the kind of dynamic that's uh, that's generating this. Okay, so so the um, the uh, cool subversive thought here is that the heterogeneity that looked weird and troubling to us at the beginning in Choi et al. is actually what causes uh, economies once they once we get past really homogeneous economies, that heterogeneity, um, given the distribution of characteristics of subjects' preferences, ends up protecting uniqueness and, um, and existence. Okay, so to conclude, um, well, this is all stuff I, ju I just said in the last hour, but uh, GE uh, predicts aggregate market behavior in economies with real preferences quite well. We get really strong comparative static uh, statics. Um, what, as long as uh, wealth effects aren't too strong, uh, we, we get convergence. Uh, pathologies are implicit in subjects' preferences, but heterogeneity is protective against it. They're strongly protect, protective. Once we get up to uh, 15 or 20 subjects, pathologies are pretty much gone. And this is true even though individual preferences, as I said, are, are uh, um, perfectly capable of producing pathological economies. Um, so this is a new methodology. Uh, it's a first step. Uh, there's lots of places you could go with this kind of research, even if you're not interested in general equilibrium at all. Uh, any, any, you know, economists are, are traditionally in the business of, of studying aggregate behavior, mass behavior, and our, you know, what we're trying to do here is explore using uh, this whole body of theory on, uh, on what individual preferences, individual rationality looks like, and, uh, and combine it with uh, all of these classic results on aggregation. Uh, and I think there's all kinds of interesting empirical questions that can come out of that. On the topic of general equilibrium itself, lots of other preferences we could study. We could study time preferences. We could study preferences for other types of goods. We could study more naturalistic institutions. That'll require some methodological innovations um, that probably, you know, probably, if we wanted to do something like a double auction, we would need to, uh, uh, measure preferences at multiple endowments um, in order to sort of trace what should happen in the market as endowments are changing. Um, so uh, that's it.